Be here now. Just be here now. Hey everyone, it's Raghu back with Mind Rolling, and I just have a little intro to go along with this particular podcast uh, because uh, it's just super, and uh, I'm so happy that we could present this. We we actually it took place last October when we did the Be Here Now event at the Wisdom in Los Angeles, the multimedia event, and uh, Pete Holmes was kind enough to come down and and hang out with me for a bit uh, during this uh, day-long series of events and movies and music. It was quite something. Uh, so, yeah, it, it just, there was some real uh, synchronicity around some of what Pete had been going through, some stuff around uh, psychedelics uh, and Maharaji and, and just just beautiful dawning uh, um moments for for pete and then there were some great questions and answers so uh, it's quite lovely uh and uh, uh we really love pete he's just a beautiful human he uh, we have a book coming out this um summer love serve remember is putting out a book written by uh a former my former wife Parvati Marcus put together all these stories of people's experiences with Neem Karoli Baba after he left his body, from him appearing physically to dreams to um, uncanny events. And uh, it's just a marvelous book full of stories. But the real point is that Pete wrote this beautiful introduction to the book that uh, is so very dear. I mean, he's he's a great writer, too, and he has that wonderful book out, which I can't remember its name right this second, but just uh, Pete Holmes. You'll find him, and it'll be in the show notes, all the connectivity to Pete. He also has a television show that just came out. Uh, we'll connect you to all of it. So uh, here it is, a beautiful podcast with uh, Pete, uh, taken from the Wisdom Be Here Now event. And... Uh, here it is. You all know, or many of you know, who Pete is and all the great things he's done as a comedian, a stand-up, the HBO shows, Crashing. Yeah, sure. Uh, but, and the wonderful book, we should have your book. I really, you know, yeah, that, I was that could resonate. Pete wrote a, a, a memoir-ish. Yeah, it's really a book about Ramdas. I mean, I've been running into a lot of people that are new to finding, like uh, Zach over there, and I met a guy named Joe and Martin, and they all found Ram Dass through comedy, through people like Duncan, Yeah. and then I was very touched through people like me. Um, it seems sort of unlikely that comedy people would get intoxicated by Ram Dass so deeply, but to me it makes perfect sense. Yeah, his thing was, when they asked him in the movie, Becoming Nobody, the director, Jamie, said, well, give us what's your two most important pieces of advice around the spiritual path. And Ramdas immediately said, love and humor. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's so, great. And that was core over the decades before the stroke and the decades after the stroke. It was very much that. So oh. it makes sense that way. And to have you guys being a little bit of Pied Piper especially through the podcast. So we've been doing fun stuff with Pete and Duncan over the years. Many of you know it uh, with, with podcasts. And, um, but one of the interesting things, and we'll see how much you want to share of the deepest <laughs> stuff, okay? Sure. So Pete started coming a number of years ago to the retreats in Maui that we had with Ram Dass and Krishna Dass and Jack and others. Uh, and uh, so uh, I would do a thing on, on, on the last day with Pete, with Duncan, others, and it was more loosely extemporaneous kind of rapping back and forth. And so we got into some stuff that made it 
very, very interesting because in the beginning, he was like, what, what is this? This is, you know, you all been there, you've been with this guru and you were like, you know, this, this like was the, uh, the, just the dawning of the rest of your life through that moment. And, you know, and here we are, what, uh, and you say, oh no, it's okay. You don't have to go to India. And so it got into that kind of a dialogue in the very beginning, right? Yeah, I'm sure some people are feeling that here. Yeah. Well, that's, talk about that. I think that's a huge, I think that, I don't know. It's my feeling, so it seems very important to me, but I hope people relate, is that there is sort of like a, and now Ramdas is dead, so people are like, well, I didn't even get to meet Ramdas. Yeah. And my, my generation was like, we didn't get to meet Maharaji. Mm. So you get to hear people tell sort of like the best of stories. And that sort of sucks. Um, I'm not saying they're not great stories, but like, oh, well and good for you. I'm glad you had your ecstatic vision and touched feet and the giggling and the fruit tossing and like, but I have a, a stressful life. My parents are insane. I have bills to pay. I'm in a pandemic. Like, how many times are we going to hear the story and when does it stop being useful? Um, that's, that sounds very critical. What I, what I mean is that place of brokenness or that frustration was actually like a, was like a womb, you know? I'm not, I'm not just saying this. I can say if you are feeling that way, sticking with it and realizing more and more. Uh, like something Duncan sent to me. He said, hey, man! And then, <laughs> hey, man, I got to help you out! And Duncan always was helping me out. And I'll say what he said to me. Uh, he said, imagine a UFO lands and out steps Ramdas. Whichever Ramdas you like. Tasteful mustache, 90s Ramdas. <laughs> 60s Ramdas. My favorite is post-stroke, very old Ramdas. I like that one. He's my favorite. But whichever Ramdas you want comes out, and also Maharaji comes out. Pick your Maharaji. Uh, tastefully trimmed mustache, <laughs> more of the full beard look, whichever Maharaji you want, and throw in whoever else you want. For me, it would be Christ or Buddha. And they all come out of the UFO, and they all come up to you, and they go, you did it. We love you the most. You're the best. <laughs> like, we've been watching you, and you're the journey. <laughs> Other people are sort of into it, but you... I was just talking to JC about it, Buddha. We can't get enough of you. And then they get back in the UFO and they fly away. Now what? Like the ego will always choose the journey over the destination. And, and postponing, even right now, our good feeling to if only I had met Ram Dass or if only I had met Maharaji or if only, if only, if only, is just another trick to keep you on a path I know we all love to say we're on a path, but the point isn't the path. The point is to drop anchor and drag it with you wherever you go. You know what I'm saying? Like always be there, the full thing, and not be waiting for anything. So that exercise was very helpful to me mm. um, and sort of helped me get over my jealousy. It was spiritual jealousy. Hmm. Uh, will, will you... So subsequently Pete also went over and just hung out with Ramdas uh, there there was a wonderful little cottage uh, by Ramdas's house and people could uh, take it over for a number of days and he would actually come and, and just hang with you for a while and will you tell that story which one I mean there there are you thinking of one in particular yeah I think it was the last one the sweet one yeah well, there's a sweet one and there's a sexual one. <laughs> Not with round bells. <laughs> <laughs> or tell both of them. I mean, they're both Well, great. now I feel like I have to tell the sexual uh, yeah, one. Right, you're right. All, you're all, are we here to cancel Ramdas? <laughs> <laughs> Look, That's great. I, I grew up uh, evangelical, fundamentalist evangelical Christian. I believe God was, I call it the lifeguard God. He was watching my life from a, from a perch and blowing the whistle if I swore, or was horny, or greedy, or lied, or human in any other way. And, um, and the first retreat I had with, with Ramdas, we, we had the most unbelievable visit. 
Uh, you know, you always worry if you're like me, other people go and sit with him and have great times, and, but he's going to see that I'm a ham sandwich and it just, it's not going to click, like we're not going to have a good time. But we had a great time. And we mostly, we gazed at each other. There wasn't a lot of uh, talking. And I really, he had this unbelievable ability to conjure, I don't know if that's the right word, but to conjure up the feeling of Maharaji, who I never met, but it was the feeling of like, sort of like a, a sleeping bag filled with warm applesauce, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that was my experience. Or a snowsuit. You know, you felt insulated mm. by like a, like a mm -hmm. hug, sort of like a tingly, loving, it's all okay. And if there's anything I can say that maybe we'll all remember, it's like, it's all okay. It's all okay. And that was that feeling, it's all okay. And mm. then I went back, and that was maybe the second day of the retreat. And now I felt like Maharaji was with me, and then I got... The next morning I woke up and I was all fuzzy and, and love and light y. And then I got 10 out of 10 horny. I'm not, I'm not trying to be like cheeky. I'm telling you a human experience. I know it's sort of blue, but like, why is this happening? Why? I'm in this room with like this huge puja table. Everywhere is pictures of Maharaji. Everything is holy books. And all I could think about was asses. <laughs> And it was driving me crazy. <laughs> it was driving me crazy. Yeah. And I was just back in that old pattern of I, at the performance principle. God is now with me, but I have to persevere. Willpower Christianity, you call it. If I, <laughs> if I can suppress this urge, if I can stop thinking these sexual thoughts or whatever, then I'll be good. Then I'll be worthy of the snowsuit. Um, but it, it didn't stop. It just kept getting worse and worse. I mean, like, junior high level. <laughs> like, horny. <laughs> so I remember there, there was a little walkout. You could go on a 15-minute hike from his house and sit on this perch and look at the sunrise. So I set, like a good Christian boy, I set an alarm for, like, 5 a.m. It was pitch black. I walked down. It was scary. I was walking through these cobwebs, like Indiana Jones. <laughs> I got to the, where the mountain overlook was, the ocean overlook, and the sun started to come up, and I was like, I'm going to meditate. I'm going to chant. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to chant, and I'm going to stop being a bad boy. Stop being a naughty boy and chant. That's what you're here to do. <laughs> I love and I'm going, Jiram, <laughs> Real, to the palm trees. <laughs> the sun peeks up, and I can see the clouds, and every cloud just looked like boobies. I'm not making this up. It looked like an orgy of Greek gods. And I was like, no! I was so mad. It looked even, I can't even say what it looked like. It looked fil filthy. The filthiest thing you can imagine. The clouds were like slowly merging. I swear the wind would blow them back away and then back in. And I'm like, oh no! And I went back to the hermitage and I was like, I was ready to throw in the towel, basically, <laughs> and just give in. And I remember thinking, I, I'm going to, I can't. I'm using Ram Dass's Wi-Fi. The password is Maharaji. <laughs> <laughs> like, I can't look Bad. at naked ladies no. on the same network that he's streaming holy books. <laughs> but I was so mad at being human. <laughs> You know that feeling? Mm -hmm. Somebody asked a question to Mirabai. It's like, what do I do with these feelings of being human? Mm. And that was Maharaji. I'm not just saying that to be in the club. That was the little rascal saying, I know you like the high, but I insist, insist you love every part of yourself the way I love every part of you. Mm. Like, I'm not going to let go of you until you say yes to this too, until you forgive reality. I'm in a body. And as soon as I did that, all mm. of it went away. Mm. It, it was like I, light just filled mm. me up and I was fine. And, and I ended up sp speaking to Ramdas about it. And I always remember he was like, I love my anger, he said to me. It's mm. like, I'm not trying to get rid of my anger. I was just listening to Artie. He was, he's like, when anger occurred, and I think it did in him from time to time, he would have anger. 
he would use that as like a little reminder on his phone. It's, it's consistent, isn't it? Anger, lust, greed, whatever your thing is, that's a consistent reminder. You don't need your phone. Every time you're horny in some weird way or greedy or lying or whatever it might be, that's a consistent reminder. And he didn't try to get rid of the anger. He used it as a way to be present and to dip in. Mm-hmm. And it didn't make it go away. And the point wasn't to make it go away. It was to be like, there it is, mm-hmm. like a petulant child, and here I am watching it. That was one of the most important things he taught mm. me. And part of it is very much that he would sit there solidly. He called it in terms of sitting with people that are passing, being a loving rock wasn't getting involved in the fear, anxiety, grasping, whatever it might be. Right. But at the same time was exuding, radiating love. You know, he was yeah. just being here doing that. And so that enabled you to do that. Yeah. We're human. It's okay. It's well, the okay. performance principle is a really, I don't know if anybody grew up in the Christian tradition, but the word that Paul uses is really unfortunate, which is flesh. I'm just going to get a little Christian-y, just in case this gives you relief. (laughs) Paul is talking a lot about the flesh, the flesh, the flesh. We have the spirit and the flesh. And I think the better word, Richard Rohr taught me this, for flesh would be ego. And then we're really, Uh like, now we're in this area. Now we're talking about false self, true self. We're talking about not pushing something away. We're talking about realizing your true identity. And there it still is. I, you still get angry. You still get whatever, fill in the blank here. But it's about coming home. It's about coming home into your true self. Yeah. And it, and it is in Christianity as well, I believe. We were four, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, no, well, if you like that, the other fun fact is when he says the law, he means the performance principle. He means what I'm talking about. He means earning it thinking that you can earn it. Yeah. And especially in the West, we think we can earn this it. This is America, of course we, you can exactly. earn it. Exactly. We would rather take bad news than good news. We're, we're quicker to believe that we're all screwed than believe that we're all unconditionally loved because we want to build up a tribe and we want to dress the same and believe the same and hold hands and talk about how we have it and they don't. And that is the law and that's the performance principle and it's nonsense. And here's the unsatisfying truth is you're already home. You've never not been home. You can't not be home. You can't be further or closer to the infinite love of God. You can only be more aware or less aware of your connection to that love. That's the whole, that's the whole point. I mean, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. He jumps from Christianity I'm jumping all to, over. You know, a little Hinduism and then the devotion thing. And then most lately, it's been Advait. He's now an Advaitist. What's that? Non-dual? Non-dualist, yeah. Well, that was the last time we talked. Non-dualism is... Yeah, that true. was our last. We had a whole thing about that. That's a tricky bowl of soup, non-dual. Yeah. yeah. It leads... I mean, there's just a lot of people that ride it. Yeah. And yeah. it doesn't lead to always the best place. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean... Yeah, I'm with Ram Dass. This is what Ram Dass says about non-dualism. He's like, yes, it's all one. Yes, God, guru, and self are all one. But the machinery needs oil. And the oil is love. And that's what bhakti is. It's using duality to fuel and make your non-duality operational. And that's not an error in the system. I love you, Raghu. It doesn't really do me much good to be like, I know it's really me looking out your eyes. Great, but whose migraine is this? You know what I'm saying? Like we need to play the game of duality, I think more than circumvent it. I know my daughter is deep down awareness, but the joy I get out of serving her and cutting the little crusts off her cute little pumpkin seed sandwiches because you can't have nuts at school is so delicious. Why would I deprive myself of that lubrication. Mm. I just don't want to be so dry and be like, yeah. Or, or there's the little spiritual bypass using thinking your way through or yeah. projecting where you might not actually be resting on a moment-to-moment basis. Yeah. You know, what Ramdas did for you around this whole thing of sexual uh, 
that role, you know, the sexual male role, and what he did for you in that moment to help release that. He's been doing that forever, and he did it through uh, the, f the first time we were in the Himalayas, uh, Krishnadas, who's here, Ramesh, and uh, doing this retreat, because we were supposed to be doing this Buddhist meditation thing that never happened, but we all did it ourselves, and more. Maharaji just kept sending Westerners to Ram Dass, who kept getting pissed every day. The bus would come, and the people would come up the hill, and it was, oh, God. But one thing he used to do, and he did this all through these decades, is sit with someone very close and just contact eye to eye and say, whatever it is you're afraid to say, say it now. And it was done, uh, we were in an ash uh, Gandhi ashram way up in the Himalaya foothills, and the walls were paper thin. So actually everybody downstairs on either side of Ram Dass's room heard everyone's stuff. <laughs> and the great thing was, it was all the same. It was all mostly around sexual stuff. Right, mostly. Yeah. And then we then we, we greet each other after and go, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And he, but the fact that he was that open vessel that was just embracing you, 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 you knew you could let it go. It's okay. It's just human, as you were saying. But the second, the, the, the second one. Yeah, yeah. The second <laughs> retreat. Well, the second retreat, Ramdas was a lot. Um, I mean, it had only been a couple of years, but he was a lot older, <laughs> you know. Mm. And um, at that point, they were only doing retreats for people that didn't need to, like, ask questions. As right, much as we're willing out. to sit in the silence. Yeah. yeah, willing to sit in silence, exactly. Yeah. And I hope this is the one you're thinking about. But Ramdas had a sweet tooth. I know he loved root mm. beer, mm. and I know he was a soft child and had to get extra special pants made. We related on a lot of things. <laughs> and I, I went to the grocery store and I saw they had these little ice cream sandwiches. And I, again, I mean, I'll concede that I'm, I'm trying to make him like me. Talk about the performance principle. I was still trying to make Ram Dass like me. I was refusing to believe that he meant it when he said, I love you. Um, I mean, it, it was so funny telling Ram Dass about things that I had done like I was like, oh, I did this TV show and, and I have this character and he quotes you. And it's just such a, you can't divide infinity. Like when somebody is in their truest heart and they love somebody, that's an infinite love. And then you go like, and I made you a cake. And they're like, well, you can't add to it and you can't subtract from it. Mm. I'm back in the Jesus thing, but Jesus tells a parable about uh, the workers that come at different times of the day to work the field and they all get paid the same amount. That's very unsatisfying to our egos. We do want to earn it. We want to give ice cream sandwiches. But the truth is, at the end of the day, now I'm going to jump stories, but it's the prodigal son. You are always with me and everything I have is yours. That's the mm. punchline of that story. Mm. You're always with me and everything I have is yours. That's also known as the good news. That's, that's really, really good news. But anyway, I still thought I had to earn it, so I got him a little ice cream sandwich. And I brought it to him on a plate. This was the last day. And I gave it to him, and I was all special, and I put it on a plate. And he uh, took it, and I was like, oh, I've really done it now. Old Petey's in Ram Dass's heart for all of time. <laughs> and Ram Dass looks at it, and he goes, and he wasn't saying much. So the fact that he said something really meant he really wanted to say it. He went, my friends are digging my grave for me. LAUGHTER <laughs> <laughs> And then almost to add insult to it, then he ate it in silence. <laughs> Just sort of like Ram Dassi bites, like really present, mm, chewing bites. And I'm feeling like such a schmuck. And then we had a fine visit, but I, you know, I got a little neurotic about it. I was like, he's right, why aren't, I should be bringing him wheatgrass or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. Kombucha, yeah. Exactly, what am yeah. I doing? And I, I, again, performance principle. I must be on the out now. I did something wrong. I was on the in before. We were loving each other, but now I'm, the, uh, I'm on the out. And I, I wasn't, I know, it's stupid, but this is how we work. <laughs> yes. I really think this not is how stupid. we work. It's not stupid. It's not stupid. No. It, no. It's, it's, it is stupid. I'm not stupid. It is stupid. Yeah. 
<laughs> and so on the last day I was leaving, my car was there to take me to the airport or whatever, and Dasima was like, do you want to say goodbye to Ramdas? And I'm embarrassed because I had just given him <laughs> poison. <laughs> And I sort of wanted to sneak out before he had another chance to go like, you asshole, you know? <laughs> I didn't want that. <laughs> and it sounds not true, but I really was nervous to go up and see him. And there he was, Matthew, his caregiver, was with him, and he was in bed. And I had never seen Ramdas in bed. And he, he didn't have a shirt on, and I had never seen Ramdas with his shirt off. And he just... So here he is in this vulnerable position, mm. almost like a newborn kitten in a, in a shoebox that you lined with mm. blankets. He just looks so fragile, but so alive too. And he lit up like his favorite person in mm. the world had mm. walked in. I, I, w- I was going in like, kind of, <laughs> uh, bye, bye, dick. <laughs> His name is Richard. I'm not calling him a dick. I would, uh, I would call him Dick to be casual. Bye, bye, Richard. And he went, oh, brother. And I know, I'm going to cry. And he grabbed my hand and just and gazed at me. And Matthew took some pictures, some of my favorite pictures of him and I just looking at each other. There was no ice cream sandwich. Guys, why am I telling you this story? I promise you, it's not a brag. It's a story about divine love. Ramdas was constantly cleaning his mirror to be a reflection of divine love. So this is not a story about a guy from TV loving the famous spiritual teacher. It's your story. You think you need to bring the ice cream sandwich. You think you're in trouble. You think you're good or you think you're bad. And I I really firmly in my bones believe when we walk into the room, you encounter a lover, not a tormentor. Do you understand? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I know I keep saying that's the good news, but man, that's good news. Mm, that's a beautiful story, too. <laughs> yeah. There's a way in which... So we became friends and over uh, quite a number of years, and we'd catch up mostly there, occasionally here. Yeah. And there was a, a beautiful evolvement of your connection to the family, basically, to the whole concept of, you know, like Duncan hated when we started telling stories from the yeah. past and so on. And we had wonderful dialectics around that. But there was a way in which witnessing both you and he, I mean, now, he's, now he says, I say, yeah, you're, yeah, there's not a cynical bone left in you. You've ruined your whole act. Do you realize that? And he goes, <laughs> I know, I got it. Wow. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so there was this, so to me, for both of you, but obviously we're sitting here, uh, to me it's about something happened with, trust not i mean eventually uh, we can talk about faith but that has such a quote unquote religious connotation faith it's a tougher thing but trust and uh, you know i always tell the story of meeting ramdas the first time and he connected with me in the way that he always he did then all the way through his life and there was the unconditionality of the presence that, as you just described, Apple that was set, yeah, yeah. allowed me to have real trust, intuitive trust for the first time. It wasn't a mental thing. So my question to you is, can you connect with that, which happened over the period of these years where something else took place as a result of connecting with a trust? I mean, that's a really synchronistic question because the, there has, Ramdas was so instrumental and the, the change, the way that I would summarize the change in my life most recently is a trust of self. And this is the thing I can't shout enough. Mm. Remember, it says in Be Here Now and Ramdas would say it in, in his lectures that God, guru, and self are one, right? Mm. Um, I think it's Teresa of Avila Mirabai that said, my deepest DNA is divine. There's a lot of people that have gotten in touch with the fact 
that if you go deep enough, it is God. We can say that there's a little piece of God in you, right? Most people would agree with that. Like my mom is still like an evangelical. She would agree that there's a little piece of God in her, and that's what's looking out her eyes. That's what's animating her. But when you realize that God is infinite, a small piece of infinity is still infinity, I really hope you're stoned right now. (laughs) A small piece of infinity is still infinity, which means that there's a small piece of the infinite in you. It's all of it worth coming to this for that. (laughs) Just saying that made me feel good. If it's a piece of infinity, it's all of it. So, trust. I had a a psychedelic experience not long ago. Uh, It was um, 5-MeO DMT, which is kind of like a death experience. So, even if it doesn't sound relatable, I promise you it's, it's the most relatable thing in the world because everybody here We all know we're in the same boat and we're all facing death and we probably all have different feelings about that. So I really wanted to take this medicine and have as close to a death experience as I could. And I'll jump to the conclusion. I could tell the story over two hours, but the conclusion was there's no gap. I really had an experience of being like Mm. leaving and being yanked out of peatness, and peatness being completely eviscerated, completely gone, completely dead, an ego death. And I think when we think about death, we're always afraid of like some blackness encroaching on us. But there's a couple things. It's you. Okay, rem- remember when we said God grew himself for one, and there's a little piece of infinity you. You're being yanked into the truest part of you. Yanked just because there, is, there was like a jarring kind of sensation, but it was also very gentle, meaning there's no gap. There wasn't like a, you're going, you're going, you're going, you're dead, you're back. It was like, no, I'm going to go into you, behind you, up you, and through you, and the only thing that will be left is the truest you, which is everything that is, everything that has been, and everything that was in a timeless space, and that is you. I'm not trying to say that's you, so you should walk around thinking that you're you. I mean, it's you, it's also everyone. I thought I might look for Ramdas when I got there. I was like, it'd be fine, I'm gonna die if you look for (laughs) Ramdas. But when you're there, the thought, first of all, there's no you to think that. And also the thought of anything being separate from anything else is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's all just this khaki sandstorm of everything and also nothing, if, if that makes any sense. But the mantra that I walked away from that with that really has changed my life is I trust myself, mm. capital S self. So when you mm. ask, I wasn't planning on talking oh, about really? that. Oh. But when you're like, how does trust come into it? Who are you trusting? You're trusting yourself. You can trust yourself. You're meeting yourself. When you die, it's like getting a lobster tail. You're pinched by a lobster tail and it pulls the meat out and the shell stays behind, but the truest you goes up, and you leave everything (laughs) fake behind, and what you're going to meet is worthy of your trust, and you can trust reality, and you can trust death. So the fact that you asked that, Mm. if you're afraid of the void, I hope I explained it right, Valerie. Val says this sometimes freaks her out, but I'm like, I hope I explained the first part enough. You are the void. (laughs) <laughs> if that makes sense. I don't mean that in a scary way. I mean, there's nothing that you aren't that's coming to get you. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I hope you're stoned. <laughs> <laughs> but even, thanks, even if, if that didn't completely resonate, working with the mantra, I trust myself, has been incredibly, incredibly mm-hmm. powerful. And that, that can be taken over to... It's a part of the practices that we came back with from India, the main one being kirtan. And in my experience, I mean, so powerful is the Hanuman Chalisa. And maybe we'll see what, if Krishna or Nina, we did it just to open the thing, so I don't think everybody was here, but it is immediately, I mean, for, for me and many of us who, we're, we're, it was such a big part of our lives in India, and, and now it's a big part of our lives here in America. And many, many people have adopted it as well. I mean, it's pretty, it's 40 verses in, in Hindi. It's not easy to even uh, to learn by heart. But the same thing ha- happens for me. It's just when I do it and I'm wavering in some way, 
you know, reactive or whatever it might be, that absolutely settles me back into the place that you are talking about. The khaki sandstorm? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's uh, trusting in the, not the, the me, me that's every day, 24 seven involved with, you know, self uh, referential, whatever. It's the, what's behind that. And you, you get more used to that, which is the, also another purpose for chanting Sri Ram Jai Ram. Yeah. And for meditating, there's a way in which it, the, the, your internal system gets used to that and it starts to happen on its own. That's the power of trusting, in this case, in the name, yeah. which Krishnas, I'm sure, will talk about, uh, well, he may talk about coming well, up soon. What's interesting is that I, I, the mind will never get it. That's, I can still, even as I tell you that story, I'm like, you were on drugs, or that sounds stupid, or that's wishful thinking. But when you have these chanting experience, meditation experience, psychedelic experience, whatever it might be, it sort of turns that lesson into sand and then blasts it into your bones. Yeah. It becomes yeah. experiential, yeah. molecular mystical level, knowing. Even when my brain is like, I don't know about that, uh, you're like, it doesn't, it's irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is beautiful. It is. Yeah. I, I mean, it's that's really knowing, relaxing that the brain is never going to be like, on board mm. yeah you know what i mean like you just have to make peace with that he's always going to be especially in the west we'll apply greek logic and we want to be able to re reproduce things and break them down and build them back in the same way mm. and this is beautiful stuff it gets his bridges and vaccines and all this great stuff but it's never gonna fully mm. be on board thank god you just said that okay guys can you cue up the ramdas film that i don't think very few people have seen that we did with Google, that Google did, Danielle Credic at the Google Empathy Lab created a, a film using some footage that we had of Ramdas relating to technology. And it is so prescient for what is happening now. It's extraordinary. But he talks about the very, that what you were just talking about, mm. which is, we're incredible. What, look what our minds have created. And, and, and not just dark stuff, but positive stuff. And, but we've invested too much. And can you guys put that up? I think that the spiritual trip at this moment is not necessarily a cave in the Himalayas but it's in relation to the technology that's existing. It's relation to where we're at. It's in relation to issues like pollution and uh, political interests and activism and stuff like that. I think that's all part of one package now. The game is to be where you are, be it honestly and as consciously as you know how. I don't know about you, but I've been sort of wondering what's happening these days. What is this moment about? Some people feel there is a sense of change in the air. I guess it depends on where you're looking at it from. We are functioning still under the myth that the rational mind is more user-friendly than the intuitive heart mind. We got so enamored of the power of our analytic mind because look, we can go to the moon. We've cracked the genetic code. Our astronomers now can look back to the beginning of time. Our technology is so advanced it makes Star Trek obsolete. We're suddenly all privy to everything. We live very much in our minds. One of the powers you and I have is the power of this intellect. Because it turns out that the intellect is only one way of knowing the world. There's this other part of you related to the heart, which has no boundary to it. It doesn't know the universe 
through objective means. It doesn't know the universe dualistically. It doesn't know the universe about thinking about something. It is one with it. But it isn't as if we have to choose one versus the other. We've got both of them. We are at wise person training. Science and its products must be tempered with wisdom. It is not a substitute for wisdom. This moment has in it the fear, the possibility, the end, the beginning. It has the sadness, the hope, the hopelessness. And if you're afraid of change, you are going to be part of the problem. And if you can say, here we go, you could be part of the solution. What could it possibly mean to transform the world? Transformation doesn't begin with an institution. We don't organize to transform the universe. We start with the individual human heart. It takes only one heart to start the whole chain. The lesson in this incarnation is to love, is to love. If you're afraid of change, you are part of the problem, he said. Mm -hmm. Pretty amazing. No, that's great. Yeah. Um, we do have time for a couple of questions, if uh, anybody's interested. Uh, my name is Alexia Jasmine. This question is for Pete. How is your heart be heard? How is my heart here? How is your heart feeling? The heart space. Mm. Your divineness. Is it angry? Is it joyful? Well, what a generous question. And I, I mean, the experience that I talked about today on stage has been so lingering. And I can't tell you, like, you know, that feeling of, like, it happened to me. Mm. You're the, you, it, you've heard of other people learning to forgive and trust reality. And I find when I do, I'm just a lot more calm. And when I'm a lot more calm, I can get in touch with my heart. And I've also been doing gratitude lists, which I really recommend, because it just gets the ball rolling when you remember what you're grateful for in the morning, you spend the rest of your day being like, this is a pretty dope chair. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I, I thank you for your generous question. Right now my heart is overflowing. This feels like a little Maui. I love seeing all these people. What a strange dream we're having, you know what mm. I mean? And here we are, but we're in a dome. Like, yeah. <laughs> when you die and there's the big party, they're going to go, we can't believe you didn't figure it out sooner. We sent mm -hmm. you to a dome with all, the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. with all of your friends yeah. from the Ramdas world. Like, <laughs> how many breadcrumbs did you need? <laughs> so my heart is very full. Thank you mm -hmm. for asking. Hi, my name is Dylan. This question is for either of you guys. It connects to kind of a spiritual selfishness or jealousy that you're talking about. Um, and looking back on the great even 70s and spiritual greats, um, my question is where do we go from here? Is it done like you're saying that we are kind of in the, the warm of Christ so with nowhere to go? Um, I feel like the other spiritual journeys become more aware globally. There's a question of where do we go from here? So I guess that's my question. Go from here. Yeah. Where do we go from here? Well, if we just be here now for the moment, um, you could, and I was actually going to bring this up with you in terms of being a comedian, doing stand up, television, humor. I, I, when I first met Ramdas, it was just so vastly relieving. It's okay, you know, he listed off all the stuff that he was not proud of, shall we say, 
was not afraid, was completely honest, and that made us go, well, okay, we're okay now. We're not in this little thing. We don't want anybody to know what we're really thinking, which is what happened with Ramdas with Maharaji mm -hmm. when he showed him that he knew everything about him. And so the self-seriousness that we carry around with us day to day starts to, to just roll back a little bit so that we're not as concerned about uh, what's going to come up, what's going to come up next for us, what's going to happen in the future, what's going to happen with the evolvement of man as a spiritual being and all of that. Because it's, you, you start to realize it's more about just being here now is a real thing, becoming present and having presence. And then maybe you're not, next time the guy cuts you off in the car, maybe you aren't going to yell epithets at him. And that's a start. Maybe you're going to be a little bit kinder to the people, especially closest to you, who it's easier to get abusive because it's an easy target, because of all of the relational kind of, I'll love you if you love me, that happens with humans, and so it becomes very difficult. So back to humor and not taking oneself so seriously, that, that, that is certainly a powerful practice, and it is about practice on a day-to-day -day basis, whatever, from chanting to meditation to mindfulness to nature walking, whatever it is. So, yeah. I love what you said, like Christ being everywhere, and that's really great, and I think the game, to me, seems to be like, once you hear it, hear it again, and then hear it again, and hear it, because it seems to be like something that needs to be almost massaged into you. I think that's what we're doing here. Mm, Ram Dass exactly. would always say, yeah. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Yeah. And we just yeah. get together. Yeah. Like what he said in that beautiful East Forest thing, it's like, you don't need wisdom, you already know it all. So what are we doing? Well, we're doing the practice, we're doing the, the rote, the work of grinding it in. Because I want to get to the point where you could wake me up in the middle of the night and I... I remember my love. I remember love. I remember to love everybody. And I want to know as I'm dying to love everybody. Mm. You know, so I think there is sort of like a, a training element. Yes, to this. absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. for me, I, I occasionally, clearly plant things can help me. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. I just need to shock my system every once in a while. And sometimes I come out of those things on the other side and and I'm, tears are coming down my face. I'm like, it matters. Like, listening to Ram Dass matters. Reading books matters. Meditation matters. You're not some insignificant sparrow fart just trying to figure out the cosmos. These are gifts. These are containers, and they work, and they matter. And what you consume is who you are. Right now, I am shaping your future, and you are shaping my future. You could be watching a horror movie, nothing wrong with it. I'm just saying you could be feeding yourself different stuff. You could be stressing out about the news all day today, but you decided to remember love. That is the trip you're on. I'm shaping your future. Do you see how precious that is? And you looking at me shapes mine, and you talking to me after the show, you asking this question, this is your trip. And just like a psychedelic trip, it matters what you're listening to, who you're loving, who you're letting love you, what you're consuming, what you're studying, what you're chanting. It's an incredible amount mm. of agency over the whole system if you think about it. Mm. Mm. Very good. Very, very good. good. Very good. Very good. Well, Is that cake? Thank, you, <laughs> Thank you, Pete. We actually don't have time for any more questions. Thank you for those. Thank Pete for being here. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you.